but uh, first of all, welcome. Thanks. This is our third of our kind of our livestock webinar series that we've done here over the last, this will be the third, obviously Thursday. Um, it kind of came out of, we, we've been doing for SFA some different projects where we try to put together cohorts. And these cohorts, uh, for those of you who've been on the last couple of calls, have heard this already once now, uh, once or twice, but the cohorts are a great idea, you know, getting people together, learn from each other, you know, gain, you know, networks and, and wisdom from each other and stuff. But the first one we did was like just people interested in soil health. And it was like we had dairy farmers and crop farmers and lamb, you know, sheep farmers and all sorts of things. And it was like way too broad. So then we made another one kind of focused on grazing specific. And even that realized that was a little bit too broad. We've got bison farmers, goat farmers, sheep farmers, cattle producers, and almost all of the, you know, the, the, um, the education and the work we've put out has largely been focused around um, cattle producers. And so this kind of came out of recognizing that our cohorts a lot of times are not meeting the needs of people who are raising some of these alternative grazing livestock, which are by no means lesser, just, just you know, not what we have been pushing for a lot. And so that's kind of what this idea stemmed out of, of having a livestock webinar series here this winter to kind of bring together producers interested in specific livestock species and have some focused education around um, that particular livestock species because there's a whole lot different between trying to graze you know a sheep and a beef cow and a you know bison uh, and, and things like that so so uh, that's what this came out of the first week was um, pastured pork second week was sheep this week is obviously bison and, and for those in who might be interested who maybe haven't seen uh, next week we've got two fantastic goat producers. Um, and another, the, the week after that is pasture chicken producers. So uh, if, if those are anything of interest to you, be sure to check those out on the SFA website. You can register just like you registered for this one on the soil health page, or there's, I think Katie put it on a few different pages on our website that you can, uh, you can check out. Um, and uh, just a reminder, as I see a few more people logging in here to mute yourselves as you hop in, just for any kind of background noises. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's kind of the goal of this. Um, today's focus is obviously gonna be around bison. Um, and uh, we've got two producers that I've been fortunate to get to know here over the last year or so who are doing a great job uh, in Minnesota and have a little bit different alternative uh, perspectives to share in their bison production models and marketing models and stuff. So I'm um, really excited to turn it over to them here. Um, one thing I'll, I'll say is if you guys have questions, please throw them in the chat uh, throughout the whole thing. Um, if they're very specific to what the speaker's talking about at that particular time, I'll maybe jump in and just kind of you know, ask at that moment. But if they're sort of general questions or questions that might be relevant to both producers, I'll save them towards the end. And that's probably my preference anyway, just so we make sure we have enough time for both people. And the last couple have gone well over time because of all the questions that we had. And so um, if there's questions and stuff, uh, we'll save it towards the end so that people who want to hop off have at least had the opportunity to hear all of the, the talks. So um, please throw those uh, in the chat. Anytime you have a question, just throw it in the chat um, and, uh, and we'll go from there. But with that, unless there's any questions right off the bat from anybody, I'll turn it over to Craig, uh, Craig Fisher, Sleepy Bison Acres, I believe, and uh, Sleepy Eye. And uh, you can introduce yourself and start sharing screen and, and, uh, and yeah, we'll get started with this. So thanks everybody and welcome. Hi everybody. Um, as Jared said, I'm Craig Fisher with Sleepy Bison Acres. Um, my wife and I started the operation in 2013. We have three boys, uh, Bryce, Logan, and Gavin. They're six, four, and one. Um, and basically, we've we started from scratch. It's something that uh, we came across. We didn't know was actually a possibility for us. Um, you know, it's get big, get out, or get different is kind of the theme that we ran with and we chose to get different. So um, yeah, Jared, you can see the screen, right? Yeah, perfect. All right, so um, you know, with bison, there there is an advantage. Uh, they're the native species. They've been here for thousands of years. They're perfectly adapted to our climate. Uh, basically anything nature can throw at it, they're good. Um, you know, we don't need any sheds. Uh, in the winter when it's cold, 
you know, they're at home. They're perfectly well suited for anything nature can throw at it. So uh, just some general bison facts. Um, you know, buffalo is the nickname, but bison is the scientific name. Um, cows are roughly half the size of the bulls. Calves are born at approximately 40 pounds. Um, so they're pretty small, but it's it's designed by nature that you know that cow is able to to calve out a small calf that puts little stress on her body. It grows quickly, um, and uh, just I've seen some of they've they've stood in 12 minutes after they were born. You know we've clocked it before. They're they're just up and at them. They're they're built to go. So the long range outlook for the industry, um, you know, there's definitely some good parts to it. Um, there's definitely some legwork we gotta do. It's it's a industry still in its infancy. There is twice as many beef processed in one day as beef bison in one year. Um, so it's not all sunshine and rainbows, but uh, it's definitely a great industry to be in. Um, hey, Craig, if that's what you wanna do. Just yeah. wanted to make sure I somebody messaged me and said, is there supposed to be a slideshow? Is, is are most people seeing the slideshow or is uh, am I just the only one seeing it? Uh, I don't know. If, or it, maybe throw in the chat if you're not, just so I don't know. Uh, otherwise, sorry, I just want to make sure before we keep on. I had to change. Oh, he, he got it figured out. Perfect. Yeah. Sorry about that. Thanks. And no, you can carry on. Just wanted to make sure people were seeing it. All right. Um, so one of the things that really propels the yeah. industry and personally our business is um, the bison meat. Uh, that's how we cash flow. That's how we get the profit um, and keep the business going. That's how we pay the bills. So, um, you know, in general, bison meat is low in protein, or low in low in fat, high in protein. Um, it's high in iron, vitamin B12, zinc, um, a lot of good stuff for you. Um, and it tastes good too. It's free of antibiotics and hormones. Um, you know, it, it cooks fast. How, how we have our steaks and, and items cut is um, to be convenient for the young families. Something that, you know, you have five minute cook time and you're ready for supper. Um, so there's just, there's a lot of good things with the bison um, personally. I look at it, at it as a uh, type of health insurance policy. It's heart healthy. Uh, there's some heart history in my family, so um, I'd be silly to not be doing this. So um, advantages of bison, as mentioned, um, they're very hardy. Whether it's minus 60 below wind chill or it's 95 degrees, they don't care. Um, they like being outdoors. Uh, they're disease resistant. The cows eat less in the winter. They have few calving problems. Again, their calves are 40 pounds. They're not pushing out a, a hundred plus pound calf or bigger. Um, and they can utilize poor quality forage. They digest their food slower. They have more enzymes in their stomach that helps them utilize some of that poor quality forage. Um, they can live longer. Um, they're just built survivors. Um, they rarely overeat and they can fatten on screenings. Um, some disadvantages of bison. Um, at times, you do need stronger fences, um, especially when you have them in the corrals. You're doing your roundup. Uh, they take approximately a year longer than beef to mature. Um, financing can be tricky because most bankers, finance people do not understand the industry and how they get that collateral and the guarantee um, for taking on the risk. Um, distance to markets, we're building our own markets. Uh, you know, we're developing our own. We we direct markets so that um, we get the margins that we need to keep growing our business. Um, so, yeah, there's uh, basically four different types of operations with cow calf background in finishing and gate to plate, as I would call it. So, um, again, you know, gate to plate is pretty much what we're doing. We have cows that have calves. Um, and we will raise those calves up until they are ready to be harvested. And then uh, we will harvest those and sell direct to the customer. So uh, in terms of 
in terms of different operations, your cow calf is uh, your lowest risk. Um, you know, backgrounding, you're bringing in a several hundred pound animal and growing it for a while. Finishing, you're finishing that animal for the for the butcher for the processor, and um, so really it just depends on what works for different operations what their context is on what type of operation you want to be so in terms of marketing as we mentioned um, direct to consumers is is our big thing um, we just chose to develop our own um, you know different producers you have are able to sell private treaty animals um, live animals to others they can do auction sales um, you know us personally, we do some commercial markets, restaurants, grocery stores, uh, schools, um, farmers markets, websites. Um, you just kind of build your own business and take it as far as you want to go with it. So, um, and yeah, it's, we get, we try and keep the kids involved. They like it. Um, it's definitely a good uh, thing to get the kids out on the farm. Um, you know, and you, you can market that. It's, uh, people respond well to cute pictures of cute kids. Um, but, you know, as you see in the bottom right of the screen, um, you don't, <laughs> you don't always have the, the glory pictures to show that that water was frozen right before it dropped to minus 12 degrees or something. And it was windy and yeah, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. So they say, but love it. Do not pet the fluffy cows. Um, maybe some people remember this, uh, what, a couple of years ago, uh, this lady had approached uh, the bison. And <clears throat> by our, our, our understanding, she was just trying to like get close, take a picture, what have you. Uh, she ended up getting in between the cow and the calf. You just don't do that. You need to respect the animals. And it did not end well for her. Um, so they're wild. Uh, they're a wild animal. They're not a pet. You really do need to respect them. And just, you know, as, as a producer, I try and understand why my animals might do something um, that they're doing and just try and avoid that. So, yeah. So if this sounds like something that's interesting, uh, you know, let's, let's look at putting an operation together. Um, first things first, you definitely have to get yourself educated. Something like here, you know, you're, you're listening to different options, different, different ranchers, um, the Minnesota Bison Association. I, I'm on the board for the Minnesota Bison Association. I get myself in trouble if I didn't mention us, but the, I think in terms of a regional association like the Minnesota Bison Association, you'd, you'd be hard pressed to find more information and get more value out of your association than we are able to provide. Um, on a national level, there is the National Bison Association. Pretty much everyone you run into wants to talk about their operation, talk about their bison. Um, so ranch visits are definitely a thing. We did a lot of ranch visits. Um, you know, the, the input that you're willing to put in typically equals the output, you know, it's um, just get yourself exposed, see what, see if it's a fit, see if it's something you want to do and, and maybe to what degree you want to do it. Um, there's different schools, ranching for profit, grazing schools, holistic management international, there's lots of different information that you can get. So um, one of the things that the Minnesota Bison Association does is the Bison Fundamentals class. Um, it's a Bison 101, very similar to what we're doing here. Um, they go into a little bit more depth. Um, it's always the weekend after Thanksgiving um, and it's located by Albany, Minnesota. Um, in terms of breeding herd, you know, your bull is half your genetics, your cows are your long-term investment. Um, Take care of the animals, they'll take care of you. In terms of fencing, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we have, we utilize all different kinds of fencing. It kind of comes down to what are your goals? How big is your pasture? Where is it located? Is there drifting snow? 
we have anything from an eight foot tall deer fence to um, a four wire barbed wire to a four wire hot wire to six wire hot wire. Um, and then we actually use um, some other stuff too that I'll get to here. So here's like your barbed wire um, in front of the cows here. We have, it's actually a four strand that was an existing fence line. I added a high tensile wire up above just as a visual. Um, and then uh, in, if you look in the picture on the right, that's actually high tense, that's a portable electric wire. Um, on the left-hand side of the four-wheeler, I have three different reels. They hold a quarter mile of this fence and you can just put in, uh, step in a post and make the fence however you want. Uh, it doesn't have to be straight. You can split a pasture down into a smaller size and um, basically all we're doing is just looking at the supply of grass that's available for the animals and matching that to the demand of the animals for the period, the time period that we want. So in terms of our portable fencing, um, when we bring animals in, we try and train them to three wires first um, and we'll hang like pop cans, beer cans on there and uh, it blows in the wind and it's something to catch their attention. And we eventually try and train them down to the one wire, like on the picture on the right. Um, it's just faster to put up the fence and, and uh, keep them moving. So if you keep good grass um, by them, they're happy. You know, good feed, good water, they're happy. They don't wanna move, um, but just keep them moving. They're, they're a migratory animal. So that's their instinct. So here's a picture um, on the home farm where we have the heifers. So on the right, the three wires of portable fencing and then the three hot wires on our interior fencing. Behind that, we have a five foot tall high tensile woven wire with a hot wire on top and a hot wire at about uh, waist height on the inside. So the pictures here show like our portable fencing. So let's look at the one on the left. That's where we left off grazing and we actually pulled the animals off the pasture. So then we had some winter stockpile that they were able to graze when the snow all hit. And then the top right, uh, it's, it's one wire. We train them down to one wire. How, how easy can that be? Um, you know, do they always respect it? No, nah. you turn them out into a new pasture at night. They're like a freight train that can't see. <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't always see, you know, what changed, but, um, so you just have to understand again, like what animals you're dealing with. Like you just know, you got to put them out during the day when they can see and realize what changed. So on the bottom, right, I actually split this paddock into three different sections and, um, yeah, with portable fencing, you just make it how you want. Um, so yeah, working facilities, um, you know, this is where you got to have something a little more sturdy. Um, bridge planks, uh, we got some sweep tub doors. This is at the other farm where most of our animals are. This farm was set up for bison years ago. This would be very difficult for myself to start out uh, building and still have money to buy the animals and pay the bills and start from scratch. Um, in the bottom right, you can see like this is part of our roundup. Um, so basically there's different areas that we have the animals in. We'll run them into an alleyway. We'll run them past and then we'll end up running them back. So their instinct is to go back where they were and then you work them through and basically just move the animals to where they need to be when you've done your vaccinations, tagging, weaning, all that stuff. So well, this is when we usually wean, of course, but, um, in terms of water, um, you know, you, you want to protect your water. If, uh, you know, a bored animal can be a troublesome animal. <laughs> um, and these ones have horns, so that presents their own challenges. Um, on the bottom left, uh, this is actually from PJ's operation. Um, those, that type of water is basically, you know, that's pretty well bulletproof. It, you have some big tire tanks that people can use too. Um, those are bulletproof and uh, you know you just have to have something that's going to work for your operation again you have to know your context you have to consider how that's going to work 
as far as the winter goes, um, our cows are, they live on snow from Thanksgiving to thaw. Um, they don't even have a water source. They don't have a water tank out there in that pasture. So we rely heavily on snow. And as long as they have clean snow, they're perfectly happy with that. They'll eat snow over a water just about any day. Um, in terms of supplements, so like, like your basics, you know, then we consider hay as a supplement during the winter. Um, we have to supplement a lot of hay just because we don't have as many acres as we want or would like to have. Um, but otherwise it's salt, mineral, and, you know, some licks. So just give them a diverse um, array of options that uh, they can balance themselves out. In terms of health, um, <laughs> you know, Wormers, vaccinations, coccidiosis, fly control, pink eye, you know, it's all stuff to consider. And if you're familiar with beef or other livestock, that's, you're probably aware of that. Um, there is a thing called malignant catarrhal fever. Um, that is something that uh, we get from sheep. So sheep is bad. Um, they, it's something that's, it's respiratory. Um, it doesn't affect sheep at all. It doesn't affect cattle. It affects bison. Um, typically it comes from a uh, sheep enterprise that's weaning a lot of lambs and they're stressed out and they will emit this um, and it will get carried in the wind and if bison get it, they will die. So, um, and then there's also mycoplasma. Um, there's a different strain for the bison. So basically you can protect yourself around this just by avoiding the uh, PPM, uh, piss poor management as we call it in the industry. So, um, but yeah, in terms of feed, what's your context? What do you have available? What's easy for you? Um, you know, bison elite grass and legumes and corn stover and grain um, cover crops. I mean, that's something that we've really been playing with the last few years. And that's a good supplement um, because we do a lot of ditch hay. Um, I actually calculated it out this last year. I did 75 acres of road ditch, um, but rent is cheap and it's a little more uh, running around. But again, it's my context and land rent is not cheap around here. And it's something that works for us. It's something that's available. In terms of spring management, uh, you know, you got to worm them. You want to get them wormed before they go out to fresh pasture. Um, just get them cleaned up, started on the right foot. They calve in the spring. It's a nine month gestation. So basically, you know, they're, they're calving when the grass is really greening up. And that's by nature, um, that's by design, because that's when the nutritional demands on the animal are the highest is when they have that calf. They need to recover and get ready for the next calf. In terms of summer management, you do have to keep an eye towards breeding, flushing. Uh, some people start creep feeding. Keep them on good grass, keep them going. Fall management, uh, a lot of people keep creep feeding. We personally don't creep feed, but we do have a free choice grain option for the animals at all times. Um, and basically you start planning weaning and start, you know, a lot of people start marketing strategies right now. So like looking if they're selling calves, what they're gonna be doing. Um, you know, us personally, we're going to look at trying to keep our pipeline filled of animals to butcher because we are butchering all year round. We just got to make sure we have enough animals to keep the, the consumers happy. In terms of winter management, uh, this is typically when we do a roundup, we'll wean, uh, we'll work the herd. Um, cows kind of go on maintenance feed as described. Um, we actually run our cows on winter pasture um, and my goal for the cows is that I don't feed them a bale of hay from Thanksgiving until March. But again, that's the context. We save a lot of the pasture that we have where the cows are so that we can do that. We don't have to drive the tractor through big snow banks. And, you know, it's, it's just what works for us. Um, you know, if we didn't have that other property, it won't work for us. So again, you just figure out what works. Um, sales and conferences, there's a lot of sales and conferences that happen during the, the winter and it's a great time to get out, see people and uh, just keep learning. So that's, that's us. Awesome. Um, would you mind unsharing your screen then for that? 
Perfect. There's a few questions and I've been writing some down and stuff too, but I don't think there are any specifically that were relevant to you. So I think we'll keep moving on right, right along with PJ. My IT department is my wife and she has the kids at a dance performance tonight. So I'm actually really relieved that that just worked out for me. Uh, my name is PJ Breen. I, along with my father-in-law, um, run and manage Rolling R Bison Ranch, which is in West Central Minnesota. Uh, we're closer to Moorhead than any other city in Minnesota. And my father-in-law started the ranch in 1987 with a small group of cows and a single bull. And it has since grown to a point now where he and I both work full-time on the ranch and get our income from that. So it's it's a long story um, on his end. I just started working for him full time about five years ago in 2017. My wife and I moved back to join the operation. Um, I kind of helped him to train or encourage him. He hasn't done it yet, but transition into semi retirement. What he basically says his version of retirement is not doing anything he doesn't want to do and making me do it. And so our ranch is a little bit. Um, larger than most of the bison operations that you're going to run into. We cover about 2000 acres. We have about 250 breeding cows on the place. And then we also finish um, all the animals that we sell off the place um, for meat. Um, so we have two separate finishing herds. It takes, as Craig mentioned, about two years to finish an animal. So we'll have this year's calves and last year's calves in the finishing enterprise while the cow calf operation runs separately to that. And then we do sell a limited amount of breeding stock off the place. Uh, we do raise all of our bison on pasture. And I mentioned that we run on 2000 acres, but I wanna be clear that that 2000 acres is not contiguous. And so the way we manage our particular ranch is we have seven separate breeding herds. And then as I mentioned, the finishing herds, and that's based on a lot of geographic constraints. A lot of the land that doesn't can only support so many animals. And so that's, that determines the size of the herd. The seven separate breeding herds in and of themselves vary quite a bit. The smallest one right now um, has about nine cows in it. And then the larger ones have 50 to 60 cows on considerably more acres than the smaller ones. And so when you're looking at getting into bison, if you're thinking it's something you might be interested in, and then you hear someone say, oh, we run 2000 acres and we have 250 cows, that, is not obviously where you start, but it also doesn't mean that there's not a lot of things we do on our operation that are gonna relate directly to somebody who's just starting out. Like I mentioned, we have a, a herd with nine cows. You're gonna manage that in a lot of the same ways on a smaller operation as on an operation of our size. And so the things that we do seven times, somebody else can do once to the same effect. And there's different reasons that we do the different things that we do and a lot of the opportunities we have based on the land that's available to us might be different from you. So we, like I said, we run 2000 acres. And of that, I always like to stress that 1600 acres of that is rented ground, rented and leased from various places. Most of the ground around us is owned by gravel companies. We sit on some of the best gravel in North America. I don't know why, and I don't know what that means, but that's what they tell us. And so we rent a lot of ground from the gravel companies, both before and after they mine the, the land. And so before they move into it, we have it fenced off and we run the animals on it and manage it as a pasture. When they move in and do their mining, it takes a number of years for them to get through it. And then they'll reclaim the ground and then we'll bring the animals back and try to restore back to a more of a grassland area than it was. And so we do have a large operation, but it's constantly fluctuating in size based on them either taking ground from us to move into or reclaiming ground and then offering it to us for rent. So our operation has, as I mentioned, a cow calf herd, um, 250 cows, but again, in different, in different herds across the place. We finish both cows, or heifers rather, and bulls on the place. And we do that in a separate area away from the traditional cow calf herd. Most of the animals, more than 99% of the animals that we sell for meat go to the North American bison, which is a bison specific processing facility in North Dakota that my father-in-law helped to co-found in the early nineties. Their, um, uh, their end of it, we sell them the finished animals and they take care of all the marketing and everything from there. 
Tender Bison is their name in the stores that you'll see in like Costco and some of the bigger retailers. And so on our end, we know that they're gonna take our finished animals and they're gonna do all the marketing. And so for us, that is the easiest, most seamless way to know that our finished animals are gonna go somewhere and they're gonna go with a good price. And so we ship, like I said, about 99% to them. We did start about a year ago selling halves and quarters and meat locally. Um, and basically anything you want to know about that, ask Craig, because that's how we started doing it. And that's everything I know. Um, but our ranch, most of our cash flow comes directly through selling finished animals to the processor. We do also sell breeding stock off the place, private treaty. And then we go down each year to the Minnesota um, Bison Association has a show and sale in Albany and we sell some animals for breeding stock down there as well. That would be breeding stock. That's one of the bulls that Craig bought this year. So I thought I'd include a picture of them. Um, so what I wanted to talk about, and some of this is going to be a little bit redundant to what Craig said, but what I figure is if I'm repeating something Craig said, it's that, it's that important that it warrants repeating. So I just wanted to talk about if you're looking to get into bison, what tools do you need to start a herd, to start a ranch, or to transition an existing ranch to bison? And so the first thing, that you're gonna to wanna to do is your research. You're gonna to wanna to learn a lot about this animal. This ranching bison in a lot of ways is similar to other livestock and in a lot of ways is dramatically different. And so doing your research and knowing what you're getting into before you put animals on the ground is of paramount importance. And the, one of the best ways to do that, Craig mentioned it, is joining the associations. There are local regional associations across the United States. And then the National Bison Association does a tremendous job working for the ranchers in various ways, both with government and private entities to help promote the bison industry. And so joining your local and national organization is the first place you wanna start. Long before you have animals on the ground, you start with them, you start doing your networking and you start learning about the animal that you wanna raise. What the other thing is with like the local organizations is you're gonna meet people who raise the animal where you do. And the, con the challenges they have are the same challenges you're gonna have. And you'll find in the bison industry is there's not a lot of competition. Everybody wants everybody else to succeed. If you're succeeding as a bison producer, you're promoting the industry and that in turn helps me. And so everybody wants the industry to succeed. And so they're all willing to work with you. I don't know of a ranch that if you ask to come out and visit and see what they wanna do that wouldn't drop everything and host you and show you what they're doing and why they're doing it and answer all the questions that you have. So now that you've done your research and you know you wanna do this, the first thing you're gonna to need to find is land. And land is available to people in so many different ways that I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it. Some people have local land that they can rent. There can be legacy land in your family that's available to you. You may already own the acreage. So the land itself is the second thing you're gonna want, but it still comes ahead of the animals. So you're gonna find the land and then you need to figure out what that, how many animals or what that, land is going to carry in terms of pasture. And so some of it may be in crop ground that needs to be converted, or you may have grass existing, but you still need to know how many animals you're going to carry. And that kind of information is available from like extension agencies. And you can find different people that will come out, visit your land and tell you that. Bison, typically when you look it up at, in terms of animal units, will, um, they, generally, they say it's about a one for a cow-calf pair. It'll, it'll compare to a beef cow, and that's pretty consistently what you'll hear. What we found on our place is the amount of feed required by a bison pair, a cow-calf pair, is going to be less, and most of that comes in the wintertime. Craig mentioned in the winter, they don't eat as much feed. It can be about 60% of the feed, or 40% less. They eat about 60% as much as a, as a comparable Angus cow calf pair or cow is where you're at in your um, yearly cycle. So a 40% a feed reduction is a very big deal. And it also affects your carrying capacity if you look at it that way. So I always say if you start with the one animal unit, you're going to be just fine and you may actually have room for more. So if you have the land and you know how many animals you can have now, you need a fence. And the things that intimidate people about the bison are typically fencing and corralling. And they're both important to get done right, but they're not unattainable. It's definitely something you can do. A lot of the work we do, if you're not familiar with EQIP, write down that. It doesn't have a U in it. The EQIP program is the, is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, which is offered through um, USDA. It's NRCS program 
whereby they incentivize, meaning they offer cost sharing or they'll pay you for practices that benefit the ground. And one of those things is cross fencing. And so when you have a piece of ground that has a perimeter fence on it, if you dump your animals out there and let them graze, they're gonna graze it one way. If you cross fence it and then control where they're grazing, how long they're there, you can actually, a lot of people will say, you can double your acreage by increasing your fencing without actually doubling your acreage. And so equip programs are really good. There's also a lot of opportunities for beginning farmers and ranchers in terms of um, low interest loans and things like that, that you can look for to help you get your operation started. The fencing that we run, this is an example of a map. When equip comes out and does it, they tell you exactly what, to, what they wanna see in terms of your fencing, how to split, split up a pasture into reasonable size pieces that are gonna work for your animals based on the amount of grass available water supplies and things like that. And so the fencing that will hold back bison in terms of being economically feasible doesn't exist. I always say that a bison in a pasture is like a 16 year old boy in an F-150. And now you're gonna surround him with fence and keep him from getting out if he wants to get out. It's not something you can do. What you wanna do is make sure that the animals don't wanna get out. Fencing with bison suggests where you want them and your management keeps them where you want them. Management is absolutely paramount. If they have the three things they need, which is feed, water, and companionship, they're not gonna be testing your fences and the type of fence you have can be all manner of fencing. As Craig mentioned, he has different fences on his place. On our, on our ranch, if you drove around long enough, you would find every version of barbed wire and high tinsel and hot wires. And we do a lot of high tinsel mesh and pipe fencing and there's places I don't brag about where there's hog mesh that's tied to T-posts. And all of those different fences don't keep the animals in, it suggests to them where they should be. And then if they have what they need, where they are, they're not gonna try to wander. So our fencing that we've been doing a lot of lately is the high tinsel mesh. It's a five and a half foot woven wire. And then we do run, like Craig said, an additional hot wire on the top of that. We keep it about six inches off the ground it's five and a half feet and then we put another hot wire on top. So ultimately the fence is a little over six feet. And that fence has proven as consistent keeping animals in as any other fence. It's done a great job and it's also had some failures. The way that you fence is kind of determined not only by your economics, but also by your ground. We have a lot of hills and a lot of things that really challenge the way you're going to put a fence up. And so your fence needs to work for the ground you're putting it on. That's an example of the, the mesh. And then this is just recently some of the mesh fencing. Five strands of, um, wool, of uh, high tinsel works. We typically do run a hot wire that we try to keep it about two feet off the ground, which is nose height for a calf is the way we look at it. The calves are most likely the ones who are gonna challenge your fences. As you can see on that one where the insulator is, is basically where their little nose is gonna be if they're trying to see what's on the other side of the fence. This picture looks like it was taken in the 1800s. I don't know why, but that was just an example on our ranch of that's some barbed wire. There was existing barbed wire there. There had been sheep on that pasture at one point. And then they, we just added, not we, I wasn't there, but we added a couple of wires up top and that does a fine job of keeping them in. But you'll notice the animal himself is taller than the fence, but he's never come out of that fence. And there's no hot wire on that one, I don't believe. Fencing can and will fail for a number of different reasons. Um, sometimes it'll be faulty install, sometimes it'll be the animals, and sometimes it's things out of your control. Um, a lot of times trees can be a challenge, snow can be a challenge. If you have a five and a half foot fence and you have three feet of snow, you have a two foot fence. And in the wintertime, when it's real cold, that's not as big a deal. But in the springtime, as they're walking the pasture and they start packing that down, that can get hard enough where they can just step right over the fence. And we've had animals get out that way. Oftentimes, because we have so much cross fencing, they end up in another pasture, but fencing only keeps them in if the fencing's done well. And this is, I just think this is a cute video because they were out in another pasture, but all they wanted to do was get back with the cows. And so that hot wire obviously was not hot and that was fixed soon thereafter. So once you got them, you got the land, and you get your fence up, now you get to determine how you're gonna feed them. They are tremendously good foragers. They, make, they utilize low quality forage very well. And so you can get away with a lot of different versions of feeding and that what, depending, like Craig said, on what you have available to you, that's gonna kind of determine what you do. 
we do put up a lot of our own hay on our on our ground. We have some ground that's not fenced, and so the only use we have for it is to hay it. And then what we'll also do is put up a crop of hay on a pasture, give it a chance to recover, and then graze the second crop off. So we'll end up cutting it and baling it once. On our ranch, we do um, grain feed all the finished animals. Grain feeding or grass feeding are both effective ways of finishing a bison. It kind of depends on your ground. We don't have enough grass to finish the number of animals we do without adding supplements. And as you can see here, there's a lot of equipment involved if you're gonna do a lot of grain feeding. And so you need to consider that as well as the availability of grain in your area. So once there you have your land and you've got your feed figured out and your fences are figured out, the next thing you can consider is corrals. And corrals for bison do need to be different than they are for a lot of other livestock. When they're on pasture, bison aren't going to behave a whole lot differently than a, a cattle. Well, they will in some ways, but in terms of your fencing, they're going to be okay. When you put them into a confined area, when you put them in the corral, that's when their wild nature tends to come out. And that's when their need to get out means you need to have a lot more robust system to keep them in. The corral systems that we have all have super high fences, solid panels, a lot of things to keep them safe when they're work when we're working them as well as keeping the people safe and we can talk about corrals all day long everybody does it differently um, but the key is that it needs to be strong enough to contain them and you need to be able to work them in a safe way we work our animals in the fall and this was um, last week and this is why in our area trying to work them in the winter time is just not a reasonable thing to try to do so what i thought i would do is just give you a brief overview of what a typical year on our ranch looks like. And so right now we're in winter time, all the animals are out on pasture, the finished herds are out on pasture with feed of it, with uh, uh, grain feeders available to them. And they're just kind of doing their bison thing. Hopefully every cow out there is bred and then they're just kind of staying on the pasture. We do have specific winter pastures that we'll put them on. And those are based on the type of fencing it has and also on ease of getting in there as the snow starts to blow in so that we're not trying to drive through three other pastures to get to the one that they're in. They are, as Craig mentioned, extremely hardy animals. I heard somebody say once that the last bison that were affected by the cold died in the last ice age, and so we don't have any more of those. They do just fine no matter how cold it gets. This picture or another one I have, I forget which, was taken when it was 40 below, and the picture is the only one I got that day because the camera froze solid the second I took it but they were just fine. They were, some of them were laying in like that. Other ones were at the feeders. They are not affected in the way that other livestock are. Our animals don't have any kind of buildings, any kind of shelter like that. They'll, you'll find them in the Leah Hill sometimes, or if they have trees available, they'll go in there. But in the, in the depths of winter or the heat of summer, they are doing just fine because this is where they evolve. The pastures that they're on are where the, the animals evolved to live. And so they are built for it. Another advantage, that you'll find with bison is their ability to graze through snow. This particular video I took, I had a hay bale on the front of the tractor and they could not be bothered to come over to where I was. They had plenty of green grass that they were finding underneath the snow. And so they were grazing just as happy as could be. They, on our ranch, a lot of, a lot of the herds, if we have enough stockpile grass, and this year got a little weird with the drought, but we did get some timely rains in the fall. A lot of our herds didn't see a bale of hay until after the first of the year. We, if we can get through Christmas without putting a lot of bales out, we're doing pretty good. So then we're basically feeding bales from January through March or April, depending on what the spring looks like. And that could be longer into winter if we had more ground to, to put them on, but that's just kind of limited by our acreage. And so then after winter, spring hits and this is when the calves start getting born. April is when it starts and then for us it really gets in the full swing in May. And one of the benefits to bison is that they're very low labor requirements. You don't pull calves, you don't have to do anything when the cows are calving. Checking calves for a bison producer basically means counting. That's about all you can do. Um, they don't tend to have calving problems. I heard recently that cattle producers can have up to 17% death loss through calving and that just shocked me. It's just not a thing in our industry. The calves are a lot smaller when they're born, but the cows do all of it on their own. On our ranch, 
the mortality rate for calving is, it's not zero, but it's awfully close. It, in 30 years, you could count on probably two hands number of animals that have had any problems with calving. And in addition to not having to go out and pull calves and that kind of thing, the labor requirements, when those cows have calves by their side, especially fresh calves, they don't want anybody anywhere near them. You can't get close to the herd when there's calves in there. And so checking calves is a lot of times from the pickup from a distance because you're just not gonna get anywhere near where they are. So they go through spring, the grass starts growing and they start getting ready to breed back. And when summer hits, and, the, and it is breeding season, they're gonna start cycling July and August. It's another good time to not be in the pasture. The bulls, when the cows are in heat, are all hopped up on testosterone and they're deep in the rut and it's a great time not to be in the pasture. So, so far in the winter time, we're in the pasture delivering hay. In the spring, we're avoiding the pasture because they got calves. In the summer, we're avoiding the pasture because the bulls are doing their thing. And so in the summer, we got to find something else to do. For us right now, that's building fence and putting up hay. Um, we spend most of the summer on the tractors, either building fence or cutting and putting up hay. And then we go through summer, we put up all the hay and then fall hits. And that's when we do our roundup. Different producers do roundup at different times. Um, what we have found is the later we wait, the more risk we have for terrible weather. And it's real hard. We use, we use a lot of friends and neighbors to do roundup. It's real hard to convince people to come out when it gets well below zero. And so it used to be November was the thick of working animals. And now we actually start in late September and go through October. Typically it's each weekend going through the six weeks or so that we'll try to work a herd a weekend. And we found that the weather is a lot more agreeable. It's especially good for us. Um, we've had years where when you wean the calves in November and then you, when we wean them off and put them on their own pasture and then the weather turns, they're already stressed. They're already having a difficult time. And now the weather does terrible on them. And in October, that's just a lot less likely. It can happen, but it doesn't tend to. So we will wean and do all of our work in the fall. So by the time we're done with that and the weather gets the heck, all we got to do is um, feed the animals. We also will be grabbing the hay bales as time allows. So Roundup is the other thing that people get all excited about. And one of the things I like to point out with Roundup is there's a lot of opportunity now, as you can see, I've got a picture of just about everything we do, but there's a lot of opportunities online to go find animals just tearing the heck out of things. And the most exciting things is one producer in particular, doesn't matter who he is, who pretty much just posts the animals tearing the corrals apart or tearing the head gate apart or tearing whatever apart. And while that can happen, I hate for people to think it's typical. When you work the animals, it's faster, they're stronger, they're more athletic than a lot of other animals you're going to put through. But if you do it in a controlled and calm way, it can be done very calmly, very safely. It doesn't have to be a giant rodeo with things going wrong and things getting torn up all over the place. They're bigger animals. They need equipment that's gonna hold them. They're in a high stress situation. So you wanna get them in there and out of there as quickly as possible. But it doesn't have to be the rodeos that you'll find online. I've got hours of really boring video of working animals. If you ever wanna just see what it really looks like, it's not really worth looking at. When we do round up, the things that we are doing is weaning calves, pulling off culls, um, sorting the different herds, depending on what we're gonna do for breeding stock, ear tagging the calves. That's when they do finally get their ear tags. You don't go out and do that in the spring. And then wormer vaccinations get done. And then anything that's gonna get shipped, we'll get kind of put in a place where we can get them on the trailers later. Um, trailering, you can use a giant semi. I thought I had a picture of a pickup. Um, the idea of trailering bison is kind of like the idea of corralling them. It, once they're in a trailer, they behave a lot like other animals. They, they stand, they don't tend to tear your trailer apart. They can, but they don't tend to. We have a 24-foot aluminum stock trailer that we've had forever. Um, the problems we have with it are not because of the animals. It's generally brake problems. Um, an aluminum stock trailer is just fine for hauling the animals as far as you want to do. Um, they're they load faster, but once they're on the trailer, they tend to just stand and not do anything that's going to be any different than any of the other animal. It's not as big a deal as you would think, considering the animal that you have on there. This one, the, vid, the reason I like this video is you can see there's a lot of different people doing a lot of different things. And the thing that you'll note about this video is everybody knows their job, 
and it goes really quickly. The cow comes in, and this one it's just cows that are getting they're getting um, I think just wormer in this one, whatever it was. They get in the head gate and then they get out. They get in the head gate and they get out. And it's as quickly as we can get them out of there to keep the stress as low as possible. It is a high stress situation, but the less time they're in there, the better it is for them. I did mention you need a lot of people if you're gonna do roundup. And that depends again on the size of your herd and your setup. If I have nine people on a Saturday, we do a really good job of getting those animals moved through really well. It takes generally a herd will take us three, maybe four hours, depending on what we're doing, how many times we get to move the trailer. But you do need a lot of help. You need a lot of friends who are willing to do it. And it's really fun. It's not hard to convince people to do it. People get a real kick out of going home and saying, oh man, I was I grabbed onto a bison by the nose and they're putting ear tags in. People get a big kick out of doing that kind of thing. And then after fall, snow starts to fly and we're back to where we are now. The animals are out on pasture. And they're eating hay bales at this point and the year kind of cycles back through. Um, another thing I'd like to point out is when you run bison, what you're doing, it gets to feeling normal very quickly. You forget how unique it is. And so the opportunity to share what you're doing, either through hosting groups um, on your ranch, having individuals come out who are curious about the industry or in looking to get in. Social media is really good. If you can promote the industry, promote the benefits to the land that the animals bring, the benefits that eating them brings, you go a long way towards promoting the industry that we all kind of love. So getting the word out about what we're doing in whatever way you can is very important. You know, if someone asks you to do a Zoom like Jared did, you say yes. And then don't forget, at the end of the day, you are raising what I think is the best tasting red meat in the North American continent, probably in the world. And so make sure that you not only raise them, but you also enjoy the animals on the pasture and the animals on your plate. It is some of the best meat you could ever hope to eat. Um, when we sell at farmer's market, I a lot of times get defensive when people compare it to venison. It cooks like venison because it's very lean meat, but it does not taste like venison. It is extremely flavorful. People describe it different ways, but I basically say it's the best steak that you're ever gonna have, and that's what it tastes like. And Craig said it's not all sunshine and rainbows, but there are definitely rainbows. And that's all I got. That's about all I know about bison. Don't ask too many questions because I told you everything yeah. already. Yeah, no, that, that was great. Both of you guys, uh, thank you so much. And Craig, if you wanna hop back on, we'll ask some questions to the two of you. Um, but I, there was one question here for you specifically, PJ, that uh, Jason had on rotational grazing. If you wanna talk about your rotational grazing setup a little bit. <clears throat> specifically how we do it, it. Much. yeah just kind of the, the craig mentioned using some poly wire and stuff i think most of your subdivisions are permanent infrastructure yeah. right yeah, yeah when yeah. we work with nrcs we've determined that an eight paddock rotation works really good for us and we tend to run those paddocks at about 20 acres or so depending on the piece of ground and that'll give us a week to 10 days on a rotation and so if they're going 10 days if there's a good grass that year it takes about two months for that two months for them to cycle back to where they started. And the fencing we use, a lot of a lot of it is consistent throughout the whole pasture. So if the perimeter is is the woven wire, the this cross fences tend to be, but they don't need to be. A lot of places, a lot of ranches will use really secure perimeter fencing to ensure they're staying on the place. And then your cross fencing can be five strand or poly wire or anything like that. Um, what we found with them is bison will always walk into the wind. And so when we do a rotation, sometimes it's literally determined by wind direction. If the wind's coming out of the north and that's where the gate is, that's the, the day we'll go out and open it up and let them through. Um, and they rotate through very well. They're excited when they see you come and they'll meet you at the gate. When they know there's fresh grass on the other side, they're real happy to roll right through with you. So it's not um, a challenging thing to get them through. And it's, like I said, for us, 20 acres, a week to 10 days works pretty good um, through the, the growing season that we do have. Cool. And Craig, I don't know if you want to talk a little more on yours and how, and I'm curious if you guys have any estimates on like kind of what stock density you're able to achieve with bison. I was just listening to a podcast with a Ted Turner ranch that talked about how you can't quite get the densities that you can with cattle maybe, but I'm curious what you, you've seen, if you know that. Um, the highest stock density that I've personally achieved was 200,000 pounds. That's pretty good. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, that, that's not normal. Mm -hmm. um, normally, I think 
we're running anywhere from, and this depends. The, again, it depends on the context. We have the, the heifers at home. Uh, we try and keep them separated from the bulls. Um, so the animals at home are able to move more often. Um, in the summer, we shoot for once a day, you know, move them once a day. Um, that's, you're going to get your best uh, utilization of that grass if you're able to do that. Um, during the winter, you know, we're bale grazing and at home, I might move them once a month because now my goal changed. Now I'm trying to um, build the, the soil in the pasture and spread fertility. Um, the other farm, the, the bulls, the cows, um, we're basically moving them once a week. It's a 30 mile drive for me by the highway. Um, so we basically try and plan it out that we can move them once a week and we just don't have to worry about them. Um, that's just, you know, it's easy. That's our context for that place. We would like to move them every day, but it, it's just not um, financially practical for us right now. We don't have the acres or the animals to, to make that pay to do that. So um, our moves depend on our context. We adapt to what we need the animals uh, to do for us. We try and keep them working for us as much as possible and try and avoid working for them as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, <clears throat> a question uh, on the show Yellowstone, they discussed the disease bison could transmit to cattle. Uh, do you know if that's a real issue? And if so, how far and how long uh, in pasture do you need to keep bison from cattle? That oh, my wife. My wife said that we're supposed to watch Yellowstone, but I haven't yet. PJ, do you know? <laughs> I, I'm sure they're talking about brucellosis. Um, and what that is, is it's, it's a respiratory disease that as far as I've ever read or heard, it's never been confirmed that a bison transmitted brucellosis to, to domesticated cattle. Domesticated cattle do catch it. And typically that's from exposure to elk. Um, it's a big deal because the herd in Yellowstone Park does have brucellosis within it. And so the ranchers around there are very concerned. What it causes is it causes um, sudden abortion in cattle. And so when the bison wander outside the park, it's a big deal and it gets a lot of news coverage. But the, sci the science is a little vague. It's, I'm not going to say it's, it's never happened, but there, there is not any that I'm aware of confirmed cases of bison transmitting it, but there's an awful lot of cases of people saying it happens. And so brucellosis is endemic in, in the elk. It's extremely dangerous to the cattle producers. And so they're very aware of it and very cautious of it, I guess is the long way of saying that. As far as I know, the way that you get, you transmit that is by the birthing material. Something has to consume the birthing material or um, some forage that has the birthing material on it. That's how it's transmitted. Interesting. Okay. And I would caution anybody against getting bison information from Yellowstone. Yeah, that's, that's probably true about everything. Uh, it is an entertaining show worth watching, but I got a kick out of once where they're at like a half a million acre ranch and there was a bear. So they said, well, we got to bring all the cows into the barn for the night um, off a half a million acre ranch because there's a bear out there. So yeah, it's maybe not the most accurate, but it's entertaining if nothing else. Um, how quickly is MCF noticed or detected to stop spread? Um, thank God I've never had to worry about that. Um, Dale's father-in-law is very adamant when he does the Bison 101 course about um, understanding your risks. Um, and like with sheep, you know, he's always said, you know, a two mile radius, if you have a large sheep operation in a two mile radius of you, you got big trouble. You probably shouldn't even try it uh, and consider it because there's a lot of financial um, risk that that you pour into your operation, you want it to succeed. Um, but the big concern is because um, if, if it's contracted, if MCF is spread to the bison um, and, and it's contracted, you're basically looking at a seven day death sentence. Um, they're one of the telltale signs of when an animal is sick is their eyes turn blue. Um, there's no bringing them back at that point. It's it is what it is. So, yeah. Anything to add, PJ? 
No, there is. I've heard there is some research going into um, vaccinations. It's not well along. Another challenge we haven't really discussed with the Bison industry is because we're such a small industry, there's not a lot of pharmaceuticals available to Bison at all. And so that kind of research, for a drug company to be interested in saving us from MCF, the number of animals that they're going to be able to, to sell the vaccination to is, it's, it's a problematic equation for them. Um, in terms of what we said with wormers and vaccinations, we're using all of those off-label. There aren't any bison-specific um, wormers or vaccines, and so we're using cattle medicine off-label for the bison, which actually, yeah. anecdotally, we had um, one of our herds did break with pink eye this past summer, and you need to treat that quickly. And when we called to get the um, sulfur drugs to put in the tanks to treat them, they said, well, it's bison. That's off label. We can't sell it to you. And we said, but, but we need it. And so they said, well, your vet's going to have to call. And it got really vague and it got much more complicated than it needed to because bison just aren't on the label. And if they're not on the label, then you can have challenges that way. Not for warmer, clearly, but things like that are the unique challenges that you run into that you don't expect until you bump into them. Yeah, I was going to add, um, in terms of sedation, um, uh, again, we haven't had to sedate any animals, but uh, PJ's father-in-law mentioned, um, <laughs> you know, their, their wild instinct kicks in, you know, the cortisol gets going when the animals are stressed and uh, they can, you know, at the, at the flick of a switch, um, you know, their survival instincts are just so fascinating um, where he had talked about an instance where they administered eight times the recommended dose for a sedation for a cow. And that was enough to take the edge off of the bison. So that didn't sedate her. That just took the edge off that she wasn't so wound up. Um, so they're pretty, pretty amazing animals. Hmm. Okay. Oh, that's neat. Uh -huh. Let's see if anybody else has any questions and stuff, feel free to throw them in there. Um, I've got a bunch of questions here, but the last question that's listed in the chat so far <clears throat> is how long does it take to finish on grass? And I'll ask it to both of you. How long does it take for uh, PJ, you to finish with your, your supplement? And I think Craig, your grass finishing. So if that's the case, how long does it take to finish them on grass? Craig? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, We've tried the 100% grass um, diet. We just, we can't make it financially, economically feasible for us. We don't have enough grass. We don't have enough hay. Um, we don't quite get the quality year round that we want. Um, the, you know, when cover crops really make a difference from a grass finished diet. Um, but with how our family farm is set up, and how we've started out and how we've kind of, we, my Elizabeth and I have started from scratch and we don't have access to the family farm. So if we're growing cover crops, we're having that bailed, we're having it wrapped, we're having it hauled back to the farm and that all adds up. So for us, um, when we did try and do the grass fed thing, you're looking between two and a half and three years. Um, you know, some animals are over three years. It depends on the quality of your, of your genetics and how quickly that animal is able to gain, um, you know, in terms of, of your, uh, so we supplement now, we supplement grain, um, we're, we're balancing their diet, the meat quality, uh, we really like, so uh, we're going to keep doing that. Um, like PJ said, it's, it's how many acres do you have and how many animals do you have? And, you know, you got to take care of what you got to take care of. So um, we're looking at like our best bulls will be a little over two years when they're ready to be finished um, and brought to slaughter. Um, most of them are two and a half years old. And then um, the, the tail ends are like the three years. Females are two and a half, three years as well. We don't um, grass finish anything, but the ones that we do grain finish, the, the meat market in terms of commercial restaurants, grocery stores, they want a consistent product throughout the year and they also want consistent size. And so when we sell to North American bison, they pay 
based on finish level of finish and age and you get docked on either one of those two so basically 24 months to 30 months so two and a half years or two to two and a half years is when you get your prime um amount for the for the carcass and you get that based on level of finish and so they need to be at least i believe it's 60 days on feed um and what that does is it gives them a consistent fat um color it gives them consistent meat flavoring the the challenge with grass finish and it's not something you can't do it's something we can't do on our place but grass finish when they finish is going to be based is going to have a big impact on their flavor what particular grasses you have at that time of year and so if you're looking like craig said to slaughter the same thing we do throughout the year in order to have a consistent meat that tastes the same in may as it does in november that's why we supplement so it's a very long answer to what craig said I, I would echo i've heard it takes a little more than three years to grain finish an animal it takes uh, more acres than i have available and then those animals finish smaller and because to be economically viable and we're getting paid by the pound um, the decision for us is fairly straightforward. Yeah. And no, that was grass, grass fed yeah. three years. Over three years. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, did I say that backwards? Yeah. 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 Sorry. No, I understood. I, um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm curious. I don't know, PJ, how much corn stuff, you, corn production you have around you, but Craig, you have quite a bit. Have you tried grazing crop residue, corn stock specifically uh, for winter? grazing with the cows at least maybe not a finishing herd but so um again our our home farm um i live on my great grandpa's farm we no longer have the cropland around it we don't have access to it so nothing connects there um the family farm is is separate from that so we haven't been able to graze the residues before i know it's done um so yeah yeah DJ, have you? We haven't, um, which is basically based, there is acres we abut to, but they're not fenced. And so it's not something that we've ever been able to work in. We do have a neighbor who does a lot of no-till and a lot of cover crop who is looking into equip programs. And I've told him if he gets approved for the equip, I will build the fence and then graze his cover crops. Um, yeah. But that's another thing, as we keep discussing the challenges that Bison present, you can't just put wheels under them and get them somewhere where there's corn available. It would need to be, I can open a gate and let them onto it. Otherwise, the amount of stress it takes to load them onto the trailer doesn't warrant the, the amount of feed you're gonna find wherever you're going. You don't get to trailer them to the corn. The corn has to be right there. So we haven't. Um, I know a producer who does, not far from us, but he does his own corn. Um, and then he does put them out on Stouffer and that does keep them in good feed for a good long time into the winter. It absolutely is a viable option if you have infrastructure to do. It. Yeah, cool. Good, good points. Somebody just put in the the chat that Butcher Brothers has a great video comparing grain versus grass finished bison size, mm -hmm. cuts, color, etc. So I don't know if someone wants if if you're able to throw that link in the chat or something that'd be great. Um, I I have a question that I'm. As much as you're willing or able to share, I'm just kind of curious on between the direct marketing and the and the more commodity marketing through this other company, what's, you know, do you have rough profitability estimates that you can accomplish per acre per animal, how it maybe compares to some of the alternatives? Uh, and again, if you don't need to share specifics of uh, anything if you don't want to, but I'd just be kind of curious in general how it compares. How which compares, direct versus? Uh, the, your profitability in your specific enterprise compares to maybe like corn and soybean or cow, calf, or, you know, beef or sheep or something, the profitability of bison to another enterprise entirely different. Uh, PJ, let me uh, interject if you would. Um, one of the, there's a monthly meat report. Um, the monthly meat report that's put out by USDA um, basically is, is the composite of what is available if you're bringing it to one of the processing plants, what they're paying for different classes of animals. So like your young heifers, young bulls, age uh, bull, bulls and uh, cull cows. Um, so you can see on there what the prices are and then compare it to like a direct marketing. Um, the Minnesota Bison Association, I have to say, uh, we have the Bison Insider Podcast. Um, that is monthly 
that we talk about those meet reports. Um, they they kind of talk about what's going on, why different factors might be affecting the prices, and it's just a great um, great way for you to kind of learn and and see what's going on from the broad perspective. Um, and they'll talk about other industry topics too. It's fantastic podcast. If you're really interested in bison, you got to subscribe to it. Um, but, uh, you know, we're charging $5 and 50 cents a pound hanging weight for bison. Um, and it's roughly 25% over what the co-ops would pay for that. But, um, there's a lot of expense and depreciation, capital investment, time that go into that. Um, as far as the farmer's markets, every Saturday, I have committed basically to going to a market. We're doing deliveries. We do what we have to, um, to just keep it going at the level that, and build it to the level that we want to. So um, there's, with that being said, I mean, our, our butcher is 12 to 18 months out, even 24 months out at times um, for our appointments. So it's not like we can just get animals in um, whereas like, I know with rolling R, um, you know, they can load up a trailer of animals. They have, an, they have a schedule, but they can clear out a whole bunch more animals than we ever could direct marketing. PJ, you got anything to add on that? I, I don't know how to compare it to other enterprises like acres or anything like that. Um, bison is a premium product and it, it does demand a premium price. Um, and so <clears throat> direct marketing wise, there is opportunities for margin. It just depends on how you control your costs. Um, like anything else, your costs are really going to be what determines your profitability. And so the 550 per pound is the same thing we get for portions. And then we do sell at farmer's markets per pound or per, when we sell steaks or whatever. And the the per pound price is quite a bit more than the same kind of grass raised grain finished beef for sure. Um, and like Craig said, there is infrastructure that backs that up. Like we talked about with the, the fencing and the corralling and stuff, but there is absolutely opportunity to make money. And in terms of our partnership with the national or international marketer, we can't give them enough animals. They're consistently shorting orders because there's only so many bison that go around. When the pandemic hit, Walmart wanted everything that they had and so did Kroger and so did Trader Joe's. And so the, the limited number of animals and the limited processing capacity does have an effect on the price, which benefits the producer, but it also limits how fast you can grow a market. So everybody who's looking to get in, who wants to get in, please do, because we need the animals. I was, I, maybe you guys know the specific stat. I just listened to a podcast the other day that said, like, if they kill bison at the rate they kill beef, of the bison that are actually butchered, not the cows, they would all be killed by 10 a.m. on Monday <laughs> or something yeah. like that. I mean, yeah. the quantity, yeah. it's ridiculous, but... There's approximately 500,000 bison in the world. Uh, most of those, most of those being in the North American continent of U.S. and Canada, um, and I believe there's approximately 240,000 beef processed in a day. So um, you know, it only takes a few days, and and uh, everything's gone. So. Wow, <laughs> that's wild. Yeah, it's a. Uh... That's interesting. And well, do you think it, the main challenge, or go ahead, sorry. I, sorry, I was going to build on that. Um, so in terms of like, PJ had mentioned the processing, the capacity, um, that is another thing that's that's difficult and might not have been in my presentation, um, is just finding a processor that's capable of doing the bison and willing to do them, um, at, and especially at a professional level. Um, there's not a lot of butchers that want to do them or are set up for them. Um, we have an instance where a uh, USDA processor is an hour away from us. We would like to get in there. They do a good job from what we can tell, but they don't have the facilities to bring an animal into the inside the, the plant and put that animal down without that animal wrecking stuff. So they don't want to take on that risk but the USDA inspector is requiring 
if that animal is going to be certified USDA, they have to run inside that building. They have to see them. They can't put them down in the trailer. They have to run them in. So you have a limited, you're limited on where you can all go with these animals. So. We had something similar, not exactly that, but the two processors near us that will take bison um, both charge a premium for the butchering, um, which is based on handling facilities. Also based on the fact that it takes more time to process um, a bison bowl than it would a uh, typical beef steer or whatever. And so there is additional cost involved there. And then if you are, I and mean, we don't need to get too far into the weeds, but if you're looking to get inspected processing, USDA, if you want a USDA stamp on your carcass, you pay for that. It's voluntary inspection. So you pay the process or the inspector by the hour for that because it's something you're looking to do. And so that adds quite a bit to the cost of USDA inspected processing um, for like local sales, like we do um, farmers markets and that kind of thing. If you want it inspected, there's additional charges just based on the fact that it's the term they use is exotic. The most native species to North America is exotic to North America. That's but kind of ridiculous, that. isn't it? I mean, there's no difference for them, probably. They just monitor the same process if it was a beef animal or whatever, but they charge extra. It's not covered like it typically would be. Right. Non, because it's a non amenable species is what it's classified as. So basically, when when it came up or when 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 this was all determined years back in the 20s or 40s or whenever it was, there, there weren't enough bison for it to even be considered to be a business, to, to be a thing. Um, they had already been dwindled down from the 30 to 60 million that used to be out there. Um, so it's a non-amenable species. What does that mean? It's, it's like deer and, and elk. It's, it um, has a different classification. We have to pay for that inspector. Whereas like uh, the different um, legislation will pay for that inspector if, if you're bringing a beef in. We, we have to pay the inspector's time. It's something that's outside of the normal realm. And, and um, ironically, it has some advantages in terms of marketing the animal um, and, and uh, shipping that. But uh, the Bison Insider podcast, they actually talked about it here just the other day um, when they had their monthly one. Um, about the non amenable species and having a USDA inspector out and pasture harvesting animals. So, um, yeah, depending on what you need, you, you just kind of have to go find it. Good to know. Um, I think that's all the questions I've got. Are there any other questions here before we wrap up from anybody? Otherwise, thank you both so much. That was fantastic. I, I appreciate it. And, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I'm not sure if there's uh, resources that you would point people to. In addition, I know you mentioned the, uh, the Minnesota Bison Association and State. If there's any other resources you'd point people to, uh, you, you can mention those. But there was just a question thrown here. Do either of you know if the USDA will start field inspection like Canada? I know the NBA was working on it last year. I don't know if there's an official um movement on that i do know that we have a, a processor locally who's his usda inspector we haven't had to do it but if you have like exa an example of like a bull there's just no way you're going to get him on the trailer she will come to the pasture and do her inspection on site um, there's a significant cost involved there um, but it is something that can happen and then like craig said north star bison does i don't know if they do exclusively but they do a, and they do grass finish as well um, they do a lot of field harvest and that's inspected processing too. So they have, there is a way to make it happen, but I don't know anything more about it than that. It's pretty difficult is, is what I gather because they have a pasture located next to the, the kill plant that they've put them down in the pasture and, and they're on a clock on mm -hmm. when that animal has to be on the hook. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Interesting, that makes sense. Um, awesome. Well, yeah, it, it last, I guess, question there that I was asking is if there's any resources that you haven't mentioned, or if you want to highlight some of the ones you have mentioned, again, just for people who might be interested. The yeah. website, yeah, go ahead, Greg. No, you got it, man. <laughs> I was gonna say the website for the National Bison Association has a lot of information on it. A lot of it's behind the paywall. You have to be a member first. 
um, but there's quite a bit about production resources. Um, there's financial like spreadsheets that you can get from them. There's a lot of different info through them and the regional organization. So I'd, I'd plug them right away. They're going to be the most information you're going to get is from talking to somebody. And the way you're going to talk to somebody is to join these organizations to attend their educational conferences. The Minnesota Association Conference is coming up March. Is that right, Craig? Yeah. I think it's in March. Um, those conferences have all kinds of educational opportunities, and they also have the opportunity for you to just sit and talk to somebody about what they do and how they do it. Um, when I went to this past summer, the National Bison Association had their summer conference, and at lunch one of the days, they said, oh, everybody stand up if you're new to the industry or thinking of getting in, and more than half of the people there stood up. It was incredible to see just this whole group of people that are just interested in the animal, interested in the industry, and attending the conferences to learn what they need to know. Beyond that, um, the Center for Excellence of Bison Studies just opened recently, and that has a lot of information on their website. I don't know the website, but I'm sure you can Google it. And then I saw something the other day, bear with me if I can find it. It was like the SDSU or somebody had a really good, um, I'd have to look to see who it was, but I, if you Googled it, they had a really good beginning bison, um, like rancher, like things to think about. And it was a really well-written and it covered a lot of the same stuff that we're talking about tonight. And it was, it was really good to just be like, hey, here's the things to consider. And I guess beyond that, the podcast Craig mentioned is really good just to get a feel for the industry, industry outlooks, different ways people are doing different things. Um, and then if there's a rancher near you, just talk to them. They're gonna be more than happy to talk about their animals, to talk about what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, my father-in-law, if you get him going, you better have some time because he's going to just keep going. It's the people in this industry are passionate about what we do. We're passionate about the animals that we raise. And as long as you're willing to listen, we'll keep talking. We love the bison for bison. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've gotten Dale talking before and, and I, it is true. He'll he'll talk for a while about it but you know it's something that we love it's it's easy to talk about because it's something that we love and there aren't very many bison producers um around um myself i'm i'm kind of in a dead zone in terms of bison production south central minnesota i'm the largest producer in south central minnesota i'm also like the only producer in south central minnesota so <laughs> that's what that doesn't say. say a whole lot yeah. but uh you know it's <laughs> You might travel, you might have to travel a half hour, an hour, maybe even two hours to find somebody, but man, you're going to, you're going to get so much out of the time that you spend on that farm. You can look through their operation because they're going to show you, they're going to show you if you ask, um, you can look at how they're doing their operation, what things you like, what things you don't like, um, and just gleaning the, the golden nuggets out of, out of that discussion, um, helps you form a, a very good baseline for yourself and um yeah getting yourself started off on the right foot um i was looking up the minnesota bison association uh conference is march 18th through the 20th it's in baldwin wisconsin this year um we are the minnesota bison association but we are a, a regional um we do have a regional reach. Uh, I believe we have 14 different states, members from 14 different states and uh, two Canadian provinces. Um, so the, uh, yeah, we've had conferences in South Dakota, Minnesota, um, Wisconsin. So again, the Bison Insider Podcast, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Um, it's, it's been growing. Adam's got great people on there all the time talking about what's kind of going on, what's shaking in the industry minnesota bison association i mean join in terms of regional association it really how how do you get more out of it than what we're able to to give to our members national great if you're going to run the animals they're grass-based their diet is grass-based so you do have to understand um, some of that nutrition stuff so just find what's what's out there I went to the Soil Health Academy. I've gone to grazing schools. Um, I've, I want to go to ranching for profit to understand the very minute um, economics of, of the operation, but just learn as much as you can. Um, it's going to make it so much easier. Yeah. 
Well, thanks, guys. Uh, everybody's going to miss the first day of that conference because that's our SFA annual conference on March 18th. So I apologize for that, but obviously that takes priority here. Um, <laughs> uh, and I do party the next day. PJ. Yeah, 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 you can have a good time the next day. PJ, go ahead. One more plug I would put in is uh, when my father-in-law first started into Bison and he wanted to start ranching, he went to the bank looking for a loan and he had, he had a good business plan and the loan officer said, I'm going to approve your loan with one stipulation and that stipulation is you have to enroll in farm business management classes and as long as you're taking those classes, I'll, I'll go ahead and work on you with this. So when I came back and joined the operation, Dale had me do the same thing. And we, we, I've enrolled in the Farm Business Management School, which is through the Minnesota Technical Colleges. And it's a very, very good way to have somebody who's completely objective, look at your business plans, look at your finances, look at what you're doing well enterprise-wise and things you're not doing as well and suggest ways you could improve. And it's, it's from a different perspective than you could find anywhere else. So the Farm Business Management School um, for us has been a very big deal um, and I would recommend it to anybody. Even if you're just getting started, it really, it tells you what it is you need to know so that you know what you need to know when you need to know it instead of finding out you needed to know it last week and you don't know yet. Yeah. And I noticed that my professor was on the call so I thought I'd plug that quick. While <laughs> good, good. Um, one last reminder for everybody to next week, we've got an awesome session just like this on, on goat production with one person who does kind of a service-based grazing of, you know, uh, buckthorn clearing and stuff like that. And another person who's got a bunch of woods and grazes in the, the woods. So that's great. And then the week after that, we got one on pastured chicken production. Um, so be sure to tune in on those if you're interested. Otherwise, thanks everybody so much for joining and thank you, PJ and Craig. That was fantastic. And this recording should be up on YouTube sometime in the next few weeks. So uh, thanks everybody and have a wonderful rest of your night. Thanks, Jared. Good one. Yeah.